Hello everyone, this is another one of our um, question and answer sessions uh, that we, we've done before. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. We had about 600 questions from all different parts of the world. So the first one is from Benedict. I voted Remain, but think a second referendum is partly responsible for making no deal more likely. Can you tell me why I'm wrong? This question I think is felt quite deeply by a lot of people who voted Remain. And I completely understand the thinking behind it. In the end, I think there only are two things that work in the Brexit context. One is that we think again, change our decision, decide on the basis of all the evidence to stay in Europe. But the other is if you're going to do Brexit and you're doing it in order to honor the result of the 2016 referendum, I think there's very little point in doing a Brexit that those who voted for Brexit and most ardently supported are going to claim isn't really Brexit. You neither satisfy the significant numbers of people who want to stay, nor do you really honor what people claim is the mandate of the 2016 referendum. The next question is from Leon. How do you think we get the public to start preparing for the big technology changes that are coming? So my view is that the technological revolution we're living through is going to accelerate. The opportunities are you can transform the way we do things and do them more effectively. Artificial intelligence, big data, quantum computing and time, all of these things are going to allow us, for example, to do healthcare more efficiently, education more efficiently, even fighting crime. Even whole transport systems will get revolutionized. It'll offer us great opportunities for the future, but it's also going to mean that a lot of people are put out of work. So how do you prepare society for this? The first is we need a better dialogue between the, what I call the change makers and the policy makers. In other words, lots of people in politics, they don't quite understand this technology. They don't really get it. So the first thing is you've got to put the two together. It's one of the things the Institute's now doing is creating a special unit where we'll have people who are involved in politics, talking to those involved in technology and working out how you access the opportunities, mitigate the problems. The second thing is we're going to have to prepare industry. And the third thing is we need to make sure that our education system provide the infrastructure and the skills and the training and the help for people to prepare them for a world in which they may be doing many different jobs and many different phases of their life and where they're, they're literate, comfortable with the technology. This is what we should be focused on. If I was back in government today, technology and the technological transformation, it would be literally the number one thing on the agenda. So Janet from Kent, what would you do differently now to address the dire crime problem and the decay of communities in the UK? The Institute's just published um, a paper on crime. It sets out a whole series of analyses of what's actually going on in the world of crime at the moment and what government should be doing about it. Essentially, what we say is it needs a whole new plan of action. Now, I think the old mantra that we used in 1997, tough, tough on, on crime, crime, tough on, on the, the causes, causes of, crime, of crime, I still think it's got a lot to recommend it. But the context of crime has changed. Drug gangs that operate across county lines today, you've got this surge in knife crime, you've got organized crime operating with technology in a much more sophisticated way than before. You've got a whole international dimension to this. And then you've got the, the old problems of antisocial behavior, how you get more police on the street and so on. I think you do need to get tough on certain types of crime, but you also need to repair some of the torn social fabric in communities. So for example, when we were in office, we had these community partnerships, which were incredibly important in providing alternatives for young people, in working out what were the deep social problems happening in communities and how you address them. I think you need to address the social exclusion of a category of young people and families who are literally cut, a, cut apart from society's mainstream and who are responsible on their own, by the way, for a large proportion of the crime. And, you know, we need as well to, to be rebuilding that sense of community and those bonds of community that the years of austerity have in many ways degraded over these last few years. Things that we used to do like Sure Start and programs that, that encourage young people uh, to be better educated, better skilled, better aware of, 
of what the opportunities are in society. All of this needs to be put back together. Right, Margaret from London asks a question I'm often asked, if you had your time as prime minister again, would you change anything? I mean, the short answer is you'd be pretty crazy if you wouldn't, given the, the years of experience, um, both as prime minister and afterwards, teach you a lot about the world. I think post 9-11, we underestimate, I think, the scale and depth of the radical extreme forces, the Islamist forces, who are going to undermine any attempt to put those countries back on the right path. We underestimated the sectarianism that unfortunately blights a lot of the Middle East and the broader region. On the other hand, I still think that the battle that you're fighting against extremism is worth fighting. And, you know, yes, there are problems when you intervene in countries, but there are also, as we see from Syria, problems when you don't. On public service reform, if I had my time again, I would have accelerated faster into those reforms than we did um, at the time. You know, we put a lot of investment into some of the poorest communities in the country. We had a real sense of what we could do in those metropolitan areas. What I came to see, you know, as I came to the end of my time is that outside of those metropolitan areas, yes, we put in investment, but for example, you look at the seaside towns, you look at some of the areas just outside Manchester or just outside Newcastle, and you see, you know, there were there were gaps there in that provision. Some of the basic approaches of a moderate, sensible, um, centre-left, progressive politics would be the same, but the policy agenda, particularly around things like technology, infrastructure, would be very, very different. I guess one final thing is that when I was in office, we often talked about the rise of China and its importance. Now I understand the centrality of understanding China and being able to engage with it. Segar, or Segar, I hope I've got the pronunciation right, asked this question, what's your opinion on fake news and what impact do you think it has on the radicalization of young people? So I think social media is a revolutionary phenomenon. You know, when we look back on this period of history, it may be that we identify it as the single biggest change maker in the way we conduct politics. In one sense, it's enormously liberating, and in another sense, it's obviously enormously challenging and dangerous because it means that you know, daft, crazy conspiracy theories can get, you know, a pair of legs and get running before anyone's able to, to say, well, hang on a minute, this is just nonsense. We're just doing an analysis, which we'll publish shortly, of far-right propaganda. Their ability to catch fire around the internet is, is extraordinary. If you're not careful, what people do is they have a view, and then what they do is basically just operate within the same environment of opinion all the time without ever hearing an opposite or different type of opinion. I mean, I see this the whole time on the Israeli-Palestinian question where it's now become incredibly polarized and basically people from both sides of the argument tend not to mix much or talk much with people who have an opposite point of view, except when on social media they're exchanging bits of abuse with each other. It does have a real impact, uh, and not just on young people, by the way, but on, on, on the state of politics. At this point in time, I, I've got to say, it's one of these questions, I'm not sure what the answer to it is. But I think you will get to the point where this becomes such a big issue for democracy that people are going to expect some form of rules or framework within which social media operates. Peter says, what steps should we all take to tackle climate change? The only answer to climate change ultimately is science and technology. We've got to be able to consume sustainably. You know, a lot of the discourse in green politics is about how we make lifestyle choices in order to, particularly in the developed world and the Western world, to reduce carbon footprint. And many of those things are completely sensible. We're gonna to have to find ways of providing the scientific and technological solutions that allow us to do that sustainably. India, Africa, China, when you take the African population is going to double in the next 30 years. Those people who want to consume, they're not going to say we can't consume, but we can help those countries as they develop to consume sustainably. So we can help them with, the, for example, renewable energy solutions rather than coal-fired solutions. But we've got to be realistic about this. Unless you've got the science and technology that can allow you, and we're making huge advances, unless we can do it that way, then this isn't going to succeed. But that brings me to the second point, which is there is a real need for government action. And globally, 
and nationally to provide the framework where you're incentivizing all of those developments. I was heavily involved um, in the signing of the Kyoto Treaty. We introduced the first climate change legislation. I was in government here in the UK, but I came to the very strong view that you need this global accord, really clear environmental targets to it, but you need also governments to be cooperating together, sharing the technology, harnessing every single possibility, including new forms of nuclear power, maybe, maybe in time nuclear fusion. You know, you need to put all of this together in a framework where governments are incentivizing the private sector, scientific community, the university community to develop uh, the means of doing this. And then thirdly, and obviously, we need citizens to be concerned and involved, you know, to do what they can themselves, but also to be saying to government and to their employers, this is a major part of our identity of ourselves as you know, global citizens. I think green politics is no longer a single issue. It's about a way of life, it's about a way of thinking. So Caitlin from Ashton under Lyme asks, if you could give one piece of advice to the new prime minister, what would it be? <laughs> well, um, I mean, there's one pretty obvious one, which is uh, don't do it. This no deal is a crazy idea. It's um, far too big a risk for the country to take. and. I sincerely hope even now that he he doesn't do it. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people giving him that advice. You've got all the day-to-day -day issues that come at you. And what's really important as, as a leader, and this is true being a leader of a country, but actually leader of any organization, is that you create the space and time to think strategically. All this stuff's going on, but what are we really here for? What are we trying to do? How do we keep our focus on the big picture? You know, that's the reason why we did things like reforming the university fee system and so on. You know, things that were not, frankly, things you'd want to do particularly for short-term political benefit, but things that would be strategically long-term useful. That would be, that would be my, my piece of advice, along with, as I say, the very obvious one, which is don't do what you want to do on Brexit. So Rosie uh, asks, what do you recommend politically homeless people in the center ground do when we don't have a new party, but still have the ideas? That's a pretty good question, to which is not an easy answer, because in the end, you know, you need a political party to be able to advance ideas. The most important thing is to build up a network of people who you're exchanging those ideas with, because at some point, something will give in British politics. Either one of the two mainstream parties will come back to the centre, or alternatively, the Liberal Democrats will gain in support and prominence, some of which is happening now, uh, or there'll be something completely new. But in the meantime, the most important thing is keep in touch with people, keep thinking through what the ideas really are that allow you to have an agenda for the future that's radical. Uh, and game-changing, but still realistic and sensible. I don't believe that the country really thinks that there should be solely a political choice between a no-deal Brexit-dominated Conservative Party that's really not true to traditional principles of conservatism, or a far-left clique at the top of the Labour Party who aren't, frankly, really in the traditions of the Labour Party either. So I think you'll have to watch this space a bit as well, Rosie. Joe asks, who would you most like to invite to your house for a dinner party? <laughs> Obviously from British politics, Churchill will be interesting as would Gladstone or Attlee, I think. Chinggis Khan, fascinating historical figure. Alexander the Great, those would be interesting people from, um, from military and political background. Gandhi, of course. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, a genius. Picasso, one other guest, Confucius. So I've just been reading a whole lot about the history of China and the impact of Confucianism. It's very, it's fascinating how much it teaches you about how China is today. It's enough to be getting on with, <laughs> but it's a very random group of people. I, I, I know. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you for participating in this. Thank you for your interest. What we are going to do is do this again. Please keep engaged with the Institute. We find the interaction we have with you, not just fascinating, but immensely useful for the work that we do. All the very best to you. Thank you.